Well, I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, you can encounter God every day. Every day. He wants to encounter you. And this is a message I always like to reiterate every time we have an encounter retreat. <clears throat> After every encounter retreat, this is something I always want to speak uh, both to those of you that went to the encounter retreat, but to also to all of us as a church, all of us that ha are, are wanting to follow Jesus. This is something that applies to our lives and continually applies to my life um, every day, and it's growing, and that is the fact that we get to encounter God through the Word. We can have an encounter with God every single day, and there, in fact, there are three ways you can encounter God every single day. Three ways. Today we're going to talk about one of them, which is through the Word. But the other two are through the Holy Spirit, right? Because the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us and fills us as we follow Jesus. And the other way we get to encounter God on a daily basis is through each other, through the people of God, right? But today we want to talk about the fact that we can have a lifestyle of encountering God <clears throat> on a daily basis, and that is through his word. I want you to take a look at John chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 as well as verse 14. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 and verse 14. In the beginning, the word already <clears throat> existed. In the when? In the beginning, before time began, right? Before the universe was created, before you and I ever came on the scene, the Word already existed, and the Word was with God, okay, part of God, in God, right? And then it says something amazing, and the Word was God. The Word was God. When you think of the Word of God, when you encounter the Word of God. When you read the Word of God, you're literally looking at God. The Word is God. Now, I, the, the only way I can understand this is that <clears throat> I am me, right? I am Hunter. My Word, my voice is in me. It's with me. And my voice is me. It's inseparable from me. It's the word is the literal expression of God. When we look at God's word, we're looking at him. We're looking at him, right? Let's keep on reading. And he existed in the beginning with God. Notice now I said he. The word, and then we go to he, okay? God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. Everything you see feel, smell, touch. Everything was created because of his word, because of God's word. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. So the word brings life. Life exists because God is alive and when he spoke, he brought life. When God speaks, he brings life, by the way. You ever feel like you're dying? Maybe on the inside? God's word can bring you back to life because his word gives life. And not only that, that life that comes from the word brings light. Have you ever felt like you're in the dark? Like you don't know what to do? Like you, you can't see in front of you? His word will bring light to you. And then we read uh, verse 5. It says the light shines in the darkness. Oh, yeah. The darkness can never extinguish it. When we come to Jesus, the Bible says we are taken out of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. How do I stay in the light and not get back in the darkness? The word of God. Because the darkness can never extinguish that light. The light that comes from the life of God, that comes from the word of God, is something that darkness can't overcome. It doesn't matter how strong you think darkness is or temptation is or the devil is or what circumstances or situations you're going through. The light that comes from the life of God, that comes out of the word of God, can't be overcome by darkness. It never can. You always have the ability to have light in the darkness if you're a person who's in the word of God. The word brings life and it brings light. Let's jump ahead, nine verses to verse uh, 14. It starts talking about Jesus, actually. And it says here, so the word became 
human. The word that was with God, the word that was God, the very expression of God that's on the inside of God, the, the thing that God speaks, it says that became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we've seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son, and we know who that's talking about, right? Jesus Christ, the very perfect expression of God. One time his disciples, after they'd followed him around and seen him do miracles and, and, and you know, raise dead people and all this kind of stuff happened, they said, Jesus, just show us the Father and that'll be enough. And I just, I can just imagine Jesus' face like, really? He said, I've been with you this long and you still don't recognize? He's standing right in front of you. I'm in the Father. The Father's in me. We're one. You want to see the Father? You're looking at him. He's in me. I'm the perfect expression of the Father. When we see Jesus, we see God. And we see here in verse 14 that literally God, after all of the Old Testament, God had revealed himself to the world through signs and wonders and miracles and prophets and what he did in Egypt and, and what he did in, in, in by bringing his people out of Babylon and all these amazing things God did and through the law and, and all that stuff, right? God had already revealed himself in so many ways. He gave his final and perfect expression by literally coming and being born as one of us so that we don't just have words on a page, but we can literally see him in a person, Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. So let me ask the question, when you read the word of God, who are you looking at? You're looking at Jesus. When I encounter God's word, I encounter Jesus himself. If you're ever like, man, I really need God right now. Man, I really need to hear from God right now. Man, I really, I need a touch from God right now. It's as simple as opening up his word. He's right there. He's right there. You can encounter him through the word. And what does the word do? Let's take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. This tells us what the word does. There's a lot of things the word does, but I want to focus on this. It says, you've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they've given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God, and it's useful for something, okay? Scripture is not just nice. It's not just a good word. It's not just encouraging, it's not even just, I'm listening to the voice of God. It does something. It accomplishes something. It says it's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. We don't have to be in the dark, you guys. We don't have to wonder, is this right or wrong? Should I do this or should I not do this? Is this a good thing to watch or not a good thing to watch? Is this a good word to say or not a good? Is this a good habit to have or not a good habit to have? Is this the right way I should treat people or the wrong way? There's, we, we have our answer in the word. The word teaches us. Aren't you glad that we have a teacher? We don't have to figure it out all, in our, all by ourselves. I'm really glad, okay? Because life and the older you get, the more you'll realize this can sometimes be complicated. Yes or no? You know, we have a few teenagers in here. You're like, oh, I don't know yet. Seems pretty cool to me. Just wait. Just wait. And I know I'm only 35, about to be 35, and some of you are like, you still don't know, buddy. Right? I know. It grows. <laughs> um. You need to know what's right from wrong. Because if you just go through life and hope you figure it out, you won't. You really won't. You'll be in a mess. We get ourselves in a mess when we just try to figure things out. That's why we have the word, and it's useful. Are you using it? Are you using the word? It is useful. It'll teach you what's right and wrong. And it corrects us when we are wrong. And teaches us to do what's right. Aren't you glad the word of God isn't just like, you're wrong, whoosh, done. Uh-uh. God uses his word to show us what's wrong 
not to leave us in the wrong, not to punish us because we're wrong, not to abandon us in that place of wrongdoing, but to show it to us and lead us into what is right. You can, look at me, you can live right. You really can. We have a command in the Bible that we're supposed to be holy. We're called to live holy like he is holy, right? God would not give us the command to live in holiness if it were impossible. But if we try to live our lives on our own, trying to figure out what's right and wrong and not getting it from God's word, we'll fail every time because we can't. The good thing is we have the word and it's useful and it shows us what's wrong, but then it takes us from what's wrong and leads us into what is right. Is anybody glad that we have the word of God today? Let's keep on reading. Verse 17. God uses it. Uses what? His word to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Let me just say it like this. The word of God equips us to become women and men of God. The word of God trains and equips us to become men and women of God. There is no way... You can become a man of God or a woman of God without being a person of the word of God because it is the word that trains us and equips us. Why is it? Maybe you've asked yourself, why is it that we insist here at Encounter Church so much on reading the Bible? I mean, uh, you, you, all you have to do is come to one or two services and you will hear that we constantly, as a habit, as a church family, we read through the Bible together on a yearly basis, constantly. Why do we insist on that? Because we believe God is calling you to be men and women of God and it's impossible without the word. We need the word of God to be trained and equipped as men and women of God. And so today... The main point I want to make to you is what kind of Christian will you be? Or what kind of person will you be? Maybe you haven't even made the decision yet to be a Christian. Maybe you haven't made the decision to follow Jesus. Today you can. Today you can have your sins washed away. You can become a brand new person because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. So the question today is what kind of person or what kind of Christian will you be? Because, man... Some of you have been around longer and you've seen more than I, but listen, I've been a Christian for, since I was a teenager and I've been in full-time ministry since I was 17, so I've been around the block a few times and there's all kinds of Christians out there. Some of them aren't Christians at all. Some of them are really silly Christians. Some of them are awesome, powerful, mighty Christians, right? And today I want to show you there's one simple principle that really will determine what kind of Christian you'll be. It's, it's pretty much one, one thing. You get to determine it, all right? And before we read this, I want to make this statement so that you can see it in the word we're about to read. You ready? I see some of you writing it down, so you want to write this down. The way I receive and respond to the word of God will be directly reflected in the type of person I will become. The way I receive and respond to God's word will be directly reflected in the type of Christian or person I become. Who I become is going to be a direct reflection of my reception and response to his word. There's no way around it. How I receive his word, and then when I receive it, how I respond to it or act on it, that is the number one thing that will determine the type of person, the type of Christian you will become. And it is a progressive thing. So let's look in Luke chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 4 through 15. You guys still good? Still awake? <laughs> One day Jesus told the story in the form of a parable to a large crowd and they gathered from many towns to hear him. This was a, you know, a big conference Jesus was holding. A lot of people came to hear him teach and preach. Some of them liked him, some of them didn't, but they all came to listen. And he addressed them in a way that they could understand. Like uh, we, we talked about earlier already about, you know, the farmer. Some of uh, you guys heard this this morning that the encounter 
Um, Jesus always spoke in ways that people could understand. He, he related to them. He connected with them. And this was an agricultural society, right? So he talked about farming so that they could understand it, right? How many of us have no clue about farming? So I'm a city boy. You still live in Georgia. You got to know a little bit about farming. <laughs> All you got to do is go a few miles outside of Atlanta and we got farming. But I think we all kind of know how seeds work, right? I mean, at least as a little kid, you tried to plant an apple seed or something or a little tree or whatever. Or at least you know about it from books, <laughs> from school. So it says a farmer went out to plant his seed because that's what you do with seeds, right? We all know that you plant them, right? They don't just sprout up because they are in a basket or something. You got to put them out in the dirt. He went out and he planted them. Some seed fell on a footpath. What is a footpath? Like a sidewalk, okay, where people walk. And where it was stepped on and the birds ate it because it was just kind of thrown out there, just kind of, all right, there it is. Other seed fell among rocks. How many of us know that's probably not going to work out for the, the best? Might, might sprout a little bit, but not very well, okay, among rocks. It began to grow. But the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture because rocks do not retain moisture. Dirt does, right? Other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and then choked out the tender, the baby plants, right? So it may, it may have fallen on good soil, but it was surrounded by thorns, by thorn bushes. And so when the baby plants started coming up, the thorns kind of just choked it out, overtook it ate it up like kudzu around here, right? It just eats everything up, covers it up, all right? And then still other seed fell on fertile soil, and this seed grew and produced a crop that was a 100 times as much as had been planted, right? When you plant one seed, you don't just get one zucchini or one tomato, right? You get a lot from one bush or one tree, right? We good? Want the explanation? All right. When he had said this, he called out, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Very important phrase. Who doesn't have ears to hear? I mean, we all have ears, right? Everybody has ears. And, you know, yes, there are some that don't have the ability to hear. They're, they're deaf, right? Jesus liked to heal those, right? But he was, you know, and so he wasn't talking to deaf people because all he had to do was go, and they could hear, right? That, that's, what, that's not what he's talking about. He certainly wasn't talking to a crowd of earless people. Like Coneheads or something. I mean, he was, no, he was normal people, just like you and I, right? So he wasn't saying, if you have ears, he was saying, all of you have ears, but do they hear? It's, it's more than just information in information out but do you are you listening with the intent to understand what i'm saying and do it okay parents know this very well sometimes your kids hear you but they're not really hearing you they're not listening to understand with the intent of doing what you said clean your room mm -hmm. and you go three hours later still not clean why did they hear you yeah, but did they hear you? Did they listen with the intent to understand and do what you said? No. So this is what Jesus was saying. Listen, okay? I'm going to explain this to you, but in order to be able to understand it, you have to listen with the intent of not just getting the information, but actually taking it and doing something about it, right? And that is a major problem in the church, we got tons of people sitting in church pews or chairs or whatever and hearing the word week in and week out and doing nothing with it. And what could be extremely useful because the word of God is useful becomes useless because we have ears, but we're not really hearing. We're not really listening with the intent to do something about it. And so he's telling, I'm just going to tell you first, if you really want to get it, listen, listen, listen. I'm telling you the same day. Listen to what we're about to read. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. This is what Jesus wants you to understand and do something about it. All right. Uh, you're permitted. He replied, his disciples asked him what the parable had meant. 
his disciples. Who asked him? His disciples. The ones who followed him around all the time. The ones who had left behind everything to follow Jesus, okay? A decision many of us have made to leave the world and sin and darkness behind to follow after Jesus, right? They asked him what it meant. And he told them, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God. But I use parables to teach the others so that the scripture might be fulfilled. When they look, they won't really see. When they hear, they won't understand. What was he saying here? Only disciples can really get it. Only disciples. I use the story for everybody because I'm giving everybody an equal chance. <laughs> and not only did I, I mean, I used a story about a farmer. So all, whatever, 3,000 people that were there, they got it. They got the information. They got the right information. But he's saying, you, speaking directly to his disciples, you are permitted to understand the secret. There's a secret. God's word is not complicated or hard to understand, but it is a secret. It is a secret that is very easily found out, but you've got to look for it. You've got to want to know the secret. And the secret is for disciples. The secret is for a person who not only says, okay, I, I believe in this Jesus guy. No, 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 no. I give my life to follow him and to obey him. Listen, you can understand all you want. He'll, he'll show you the secret. You're permitted to know the secret. So here's what it means. The seed is God's what? Word. word, okay? God's word, his word. We can encounter him every day through his word. The seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message. They what? They hear it, okay? They hear it because they have ears. But only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent, prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds that fell on rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while, then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is what? Crowded out. It just gets pushed aside. It just becomes another thing in their life, right? Amongst a million. By all the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and they never grow into maturity. Stay babies forever. The seed that fell on good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, and then this is the main point. What do they do with it? Cling to it and patiently produce a harvest. What does it mean to cling to something? Hold on to it for dear life, right? <laughs> cling to it is not like, oh, let me cling to my phone. No. Cling to it is this. Try to take it away from me. You try. try. <laughs> I'm clinging to it. It's mine. <laughs> That's how we've got to be with the word of God. We've got to cling to it because believe me, the devil and the rocks and the thorns, they're going to try to get rid of the word. They're trying to try to choke out the word. They're going to try to make the word only affect you superficially and that's it. You've got to cling to the word and say, I believe it with all of my heart, and I don't just believe it. I'm going to put it into practice in my life, and I don't know how to put it into practice perfectly yet, but day by day, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it some more, and I'm going to do it some more, and I'm going to read it some more, and I'm going to hear it some more, and I'm going to do it some more, and I'm going to read it some more, and I'm going to hear it some more, and then I'm going to do it some more. I'm going to cling to it. I'm going to hold on to it, and I'm not letting go for anything. Let me tell you, darkness can't extinguish it. The devil can't take the word away from you if you cling to it. It's your decision. Because, yes, he's stronger than you, but he is not anything compared to the word of God. I've said this a hundred times. A lot of people look at God and the devil like two equal foes, good and evil. No, 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 no. It ain't yin-yang. Uh-uh. That is not the way it works. God is me, and the devil is the ant under my heavy foot. Okay? God is infinitely times stronger than the enemy. So don't look at the devil as the one who can come and defeat you. Now, if you try to defeat him on your own, dead meat, buddy. He is, he isn't, he, he's a way older than you. 
He's been around a lot longer. He knows how to mess people up. But there is one thing that you can have living on the inside of you, bringing light to you every single day that will, if you hold on to it and you cling to it, it doesn't matter what darkness comes to you. It doesn't matter what temptation comes your way. It doesn't matter who makes fun of you. It doesn't matter what circumstances or situations you go through. If you cling to the word and you say, I believe it and I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna do it some more, that can't be overcome. You want to be undefeatable? Cling to the word. What kind of person? What kind of person or what kind of Christian will you be? Really quick, there's four options. One. Ready? Four options. What kind of person will I be? What kind of Christian will I be? Four options. Number one, lost. Lost. In other words, not really a Christian at all. <laughs> Lost. The person who heard the word but didn't take it to heart. So it was really easy for the enemy to just come and boop, take it right away. Stole it. Didn't get it. I didn't understand. I don't know what all that they're talking about Jesus stuff. Yeah, I'll try something else. Do not be that person, please. Please don't be that person. Hear it. Hear the word. God loves you. He calls you into a relationship with himself. He wants you to follow him. He wants to give you the life he created you to have. He wants to give you a purpose in life. He wants to fill your life with his blessings. Do not take the word of God lightly like just, eh, I don't really get it. That's for other people. Because the first type of person, depending on how you respond to the word, is the person who really doesn't respond to the word at all. They're just lost. They hear it, but they remain in their same situation. Don't be that person. The second kind of person you can be is shallow. Shallow. It says some of the seed, the word fell among what? Rocks, okay? So I don't know if you know this, but seed can actually sprout on a rock, <laughs> but very little. It can't go far. Why? Because the, if it has enough moisture, it can actually sprout, but it can't really dig roots because the, it's too hard. The roots can't go down. Okay. Now that is a very whole long explanation that I don't have time to give about having a hard heart. You need to have a soft heart like Kurt was telling us about in his testimony, right? We need to be soft before the Lord. We, need, we, we don't need to be hard and try to have our own way. We need to be humble and, and, and teachable and say, not my way, but your way. That's a whole other sermon. We might have that one later. But the main thing I want to tell you here is that this type of people hear the word and say, yeah, I know that's true. I believe it, but they only allow it to affect them on the surface, okay? Maybe on the outside, I'll change. Yeah, it's just in here. I get it. That's great. You might even become one of those, I know the word people. You ever met them? I know the word. You're like, you know the word? Did you, could you to let your life know that you know the word? Because it doesn't look like you know the word, okay? Sorry, it's tight, but it's right, right? Okay? You, are you sure you know the word? Hmm. Well then, superficial, shallow. Yes, I believe, but I'm not really letting it affect my life for real. Just maybe on the, maybe I just changed a few bad habits, but I'm still the same old, same old, same old. <laughs> okay? The word needs to not only affect us superficially, but God's word God wants to bring his word into the deepest, darkest corners of our life, to the most outward part of our life that everybody can see, to the most inward, private part of our life. He wants his word to go deep. And not only does he want us to receive it deep, he wants us to apply it deep. God wants to, uh, God wants to use his word not just to change a bad habit, but to change a bad heart, to change bad motives, to change bad attitudes. And guess what? That takes time. It takes persistence. It takes clinging. Because I promise you won't receive the word today and tomorrow be a fruitful, mature Christian. It doesn't happen that way, even though some people try to fake it. Yeah? You can't fake maturity anyway. Sooner or later, we see the pacifier. It comes out. <laughs> Sooner or later, the bottle's there again. You can't fake it. Like our daughter Anna, she's three, okay? 
I'm a big girl now, you know? <laughs> I spilled something. <laughs> I thought you were a big girl now. You can't fake maturity. Your true colors will show eventually. <laughs> Don't let the word just affect you superficially. Possibly, we would even call this a religious person. Maybe a person that's in church all the time, but lacking the power to live a life for God, a life that brings glory to God. Don't be that one either. Don't be that one. The third one is immature. We already talked a little bit about this, but just to, uh, to take a little bit further. Maybe a true believer, really truly, a real true believer that has received the word, but there's a lot of thorns. There's just a lot of stuff that's kind of like crowding the word out or getting the word pushed over to the side, right? And that's what thorns do to little plants. The plants are really there. They really truly sprout and, and, they're, and they're, they're cute little baby plants and they could grow to become big strong trees, but they're just, they're surrounded by stuff thorns in this case that don't let them grow up to who they really are supposed to be okay now if i plant <clears throat> if i plant an apple seed in a bed of thorns the apple seed might sprout and it might grow to a, a you know a couple of inches or feet high but if it's surrounded by thorns how useful will that apple tree become very unuseful i'll probably never get an apple out of it and the point of an apple seed is to give me apples right Right? And, and this, there, there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of people that they're truly, truly believers. They really have decided to follow Jesus. They, 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 they believe in the word. They, they want to practice the word. But there's just too much stuff in their life that crowds it out. Other priorities that we put before God. Right? Other people, maybe money, career. I'm too busy for the things of God. And little by little, the word that's very real and very precious, it just kind of gets crowded out and pushed to the side. And it just never grows into what it's supposed to be. And that is also who you don't want to be. Listen, I, the way I say this is a, probably a very true believer, but just not very useful just not very useful for God. And listen, God wants to use you. He saved you for a purpose. He calls you into a purpose. He wants to use you. But in order to become useful, I need to become mature, right? I need to become mature. And that's the fourth one, fruitful. And this is a disciple who influences and changes their world by making more disciples. A disciple who influences and changes their world through making more disciples. Someone who says, I'm going to live for Jesus and I'm not just going to live for myself, I'm going to live for others. I'm not going to just allow the word to affect me, but I'm going to take it to heart. I'm going to cling to it. And you'll realize sooner or later, if you cling to the word, that the word tells you to serve others. And you'll start ministering to and affecting and changing other people's lives because of your life example. A fruitful, mature disciple, you can stand up. What kind of Christian or what kind of person will you be? I highly recommend number four. I highly recommend number four. But it is a personal decision for each individual. Who will you be? First, if you're here today and find yourself, let's just say lost, a person that maybe you've heard the word, maybe this is the first time you've heard it, or you've heard it before, but you've never truly made a decision to follow Jesus. You've never made a decision to believe and put your absolute hope and faith in Jesus Christ. You've never surrendered your life to Jesus. Today, you can do that. You can be someone who receives the word today. You don't just hear it, but you receive it and you believe it.
Today I want to invite you to make a move towards God, to take a step towards God, to say, I believe and I today make a decision to follow Jesus. Is that anybody in here? If that's you, if you wouldn't mind just lifting your hand up real quick. I just want to pray with you. Anyone who says, that's, that's me. Today I decide to follow Jesus. I figured most people today have at least made that decision. But I do believe that there are quite a few of you who find yourself as the number two or the number three type of Christian. Shallow and or immature. You've believed the word, you've received it, you know it's the truth, but you've only allowed it to affect your life superficially. And you're still just kind of living the old life even though you've already believed. Today, Jesus is inviting you to take a step forward in your relationship with him, to take a step forward in how you receive and respond to his word. To say, I'm no longer going to be one who just receives the word superficially. But I'm going to allow the word to come in deep. I'm going to say yes to letting the word of God affect every area of my life. Instead of holding on to this or that. To this sin or that sin or relationship or harmful thing in my life. Instead, I'm going to let go of that and I'm going to let God's word change me. If you're that person, I just want to ask you, would you mind lifting up your hand real quick? Say, that's me. I'm going to let the word go deep. All right? I'm going to make one more. You say, I'm the person. I've received the word. I really believe it with my whole heart, and I'm trying my best to follow Jesus. But today I realize I'm the one with thorns. I'm the one who's allowed other things to take precedence in my life. I have, I'm, I'm just too busy for the things of God or I have other priorities that are above God. And so even though I believe the word and I want to follow Jesus, I, I'm really struggling to mature and to be useful for God because I just got too much going on. And today I want to make a decision to make God really truly number one priority in my life. To say, Today marks the day where I no longer say I don't have time for the things of God because even though I can't necessarily let go a lot of a lot of those priorities, I can put them in a different place in my life so that God really truly is then in the number one spot. And as my pastors and e-group leaders come up here just to help me pray, I wanna ask if that's you, if you're the one who says yes, I'm the one with thorns, and I want to make a decision today to move towards maturity, to put God as number one. If that's you, would you just lift your hand? Now, those of you that want to really respond to the Lord today, we just like to agree with you. We don't even necessarily have to pray over you. We might, but that's not the point. But I want to invite you, if, if you are you're saying today, I'm making a move towards God. I want to respond to the word. And the reason I'm doing this is because it's important to respond, not just to hear the word, but to, to, to take a step, okay? To say, yes, I'm going to respond to that today. So if you're responding, you're saying, I'm, I'm responding to let the word affect me in a greater way, in a deeper way. Or I'm responding to put God first. Take a step. Just walk up here to the front. And we're going to come into a, a prayer of agreement with you today to believe that God is going to move in your life and the Word is going to take a new place in your life. And you're going to see change come. You're going to see change, radical change come to your life because of your decision. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just take a few minutes and worship the Lord together as we pray.